Our gracious Father, we want to thank you for your love, your mercy, and your goodness over our lives. We want to thank you, Father, for how you have kept us, you have preserved us, and yet again, you have brought us together to learn of you. Holy Spirit, we acknowledge without your help, our gathering will be futile. So we acknowledge our need of you. We ask that you will unravel the mysteries of your word unto us in the name of Jesus. As we search the deep things of God, grant us access into those deep things. Unfold them to us, remove the veil, and cause us to see, Lord, beneath the surface of your word. We thank you. We give you glory. Lighten our eyes, Lord. Enlighten our darkness. In the name of Jesus Christ, let your word minister grace unto every hearer. In Jesus' name, thank you. We give you glory. We give you honor. We give you worship. Say, we, say where without shall a young man cleanse his ways? Is by taking heed to your word. As your word comes out to us tonight, grant us grace to take heed. Lord, to hear not just with the hearing of our ears, but to hear with our heart and to understand with our heart. We thank you. We bless you. We know your word is profitable. Therefore, change us, transform us. Relieve every burden tonight by the power of your word. Break every yoke through the anointing that is in your word. Thank you. Cause us to find rest to our souls tonight. We give you grace, we give you glory. We appreciate you, Father, because you know you have answered our prayers. I will receive answers with thanksgiving. In Jesus' precious name, amen. We trust in the Lord to wrap up tonight on God's workmanship, which we began the last time. So we're looking today at the at God's workmanship, which is one of the seven pictures of God's people, the church. As you recall, we already, we've embarked on this journey a few weeks ago, looking at the analogies that Brother Paul, by the Holy Spirit, uh, used in the book of Ephesians to describe the church. And uh, we started by looking at the analogy of the assembly, the church being the assembly. And we also looked at, after that, we looked at the analogy of the church being the body of Christ. And the last week we started looking at God's workmanship, the analogy of the church being or the picture of the church being God's workmanship. As we all know, we pick this picture from the book of Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, and I just want to begin again by reading that verse. Then I'll do a quick recap of some of the things that we talked about, we learned. The last time. So Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10. For we are his workmanship. We are his workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus. Unto good works. Or for good works. Unto good works. Which God hath before ordained. That we should walk in them. Last week we. Some of the salient points 
I'm not going to go through the uh, the whole thing that we said, but I will just try and uh, pick out a few things and uh, summarize them. We saw last week that God knows us, every one of us, who by the grace of God we have placed our faith and our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ through the miracle of salvation, that God knows us on a very personal level. He knows us individually, and that's why it says, for we, we, the we is a collective term for every believer in Christ. So God knows us on a very personal level, and that uh, this scripture is for now, because it says, for we are, we are. So it is something that is relevant to us now. We said that, because it says we are his workmanship, that suggests that we are the handiwork of God. We are God's workmanship. We are not the workmanship of ourselves. We are not designed or created for ourselves. Neither are we someone else's workmanship. God has not assigned us to anyone. We are his workmanship we belong to him whatever good works we are producing is primarily for god it's on the account of god our relationship with god and we are we are it's god that takes the light or pleasure in our lives and in what we do and in what we become and we spent a bit of time the last time to look at the word workmanship. Workmanship. I, I started by saying that it doesn't really mean a workman, which is what it will appear on the surface. You know, it doesn't really mean that we are God's workers or we are God's workmen. But actually, that the Greek word that is translated in our English version of the Bible is poema, poema. And that that poema is very closely related to a Latin word, poema, poema. And that it's from that Latin word that the English word for poem is derived. So when it says workmanship, it's taken from the world of art. You know, and it simply means we are, God, we are the work, we are God's work of art. The same way a very good artist who paints a very nice picture a very nice picture on the canvas in and that picture becomes so beautiful and valuable that it can sell for a few thousand and if it's a, a very notable a renowned artist that has done the work it can even sell for millions we also talked about uh Another way of looking at workmanship is that we, it also means that we are God's creative masterpiece. And we looked at some versions of scriptures that actually in the place of workmanship uses the word mas masterpiece. You know, and I think that's uh, the New Living Translation. That it, you know, but that's Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10. It actually says we are God's masterpiece. So we concluded by saying that that workmanship, uh, the definition we give to you is that is that we are actually God's creative masterpiece. And for me, I believe it's remarkable because when we look at the other things that God has created, there are things much more beautiful. There are things much more, that, that, that have more splendor than man. When you look at the stars, for instance, when you look at the heavens, the beautiful, when you look at it, the mass, when you look at the, the power the, the sun can you know, uh, generate and radiate, the rays that is coming, when you look at the seas, the oceans, the mountains, how majestic they are, how beautiful. You know, when you look at some, some of God's creations all around us, you begin to see God's beauty, God's glory, God's power, God's wisdom at work. But despite all of that, there is nothing comparable to man in all of God's creation. And I find that very humbling 
and yet very, very remarkable. That despite all that God has made in creation, God has made man, mankind, you and I, to be the crowning glory of his creation. We are the very perfection of his creation. Man is the very perfection of God's creation. And that is why it says in Psalms, which we read the, uh, the last time, what is man, that thou, Psalms chapter 8, from verses uh, uh, 3 to 6, say, what is man, that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man, that you visit him. Say, you have crowned him with glory and with honor. And you have given him dominion over all the works of your hand. Also, we saw that man is, uh, so it's, it's, we are a creation of God. Because it says we are his workmanship created. So we are the creation of God. And we saw the purpose of that creation. Why did God create us? Believe us. He has created us in order so, so that we can produce good works. So we are not saved by good works. But having been saved, we are saved to demonstrate good works. And we say that the good works that we do, they are the things that validate our faith. They are the things that show or demonstrate the reality of our faith in Christ. And then we said that God had ordained us for us to be his workmanship and he has designed us for good works before the foundation of the world, ever before the world began, ever before the earth was made. So we are not an afterthought. We are not just something that happened now or is happening now. No. God foreknew us ever before we were born and he had ordained this path for us. For every one of us we are born again. And that's what that, the, that scripture you know, talks about, that we've been ordained you know, beforehand for this work that we should walk in them. Now, I want to continue by looking at the second part of this study outline. The church is the material that God uses to demonstrate his manifold or the many-sided wisdom to the universe. The church is that material. And in a sense, brethren, these seven pictures that we are looking at is how God is demonstrating to the world his wisdom in seven ways, if you like, in seven folds, if you like. That is what these seven pictures is all about. How God wants to manifest the church, God's people, showcase them to the world so that the world can see them as an assembly and as an assembly there are certain futures that they are demonstrating that the world can can see one of that future being an assembly is that that assembly when they come together they are coming together to exercise rulership they are coming to uh, together for the purpose of governing governing nations, governing kingdoms, ruling in the affairs of man. God sending his rod out through that assembly. That's an aspect of God's wisdom. See? And that that assembly also exists not primarily for the benefit of its members, but that that assembly of God's people will exist also for the benefit of the non-members of the assembly. In other words, when we go out, we are there to be the hand, the mouth, the feet, the leg of Jesus Christ, touching our world, imparting our world, ministering to the needs of mankind, being a blessing to our world. You don't find that in any other organization. That is the, that's the manifold wisdom of God. Every organization exists so that they can primarily benefit their members. But the church, God's assembly, is to benefit the world, our neighbors, you know, healing the sick, preaching and bringing men into the kingdom, salvation, 
bringing deliverance, relieving the oppressed, benefit of his non-members. And that's a, it's, it's an aspect of the manifold wisdom of God. We also look at the body, you know, the picture of the body, how they work in unity, though diverse as, as, deep, as members, we are diverse. The eye is different from the leg. The leg is different from the foot. But they work in, uni in unity. Everybody has different functions, but yet one. We also saw that as, as also a reflection of God's manifold wisdom. And then from last week, we started looking at this workmanship too. Workmanship. Right. So uh, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 10. I want to read Ephesians 3, verse 10. To the intent that now unto the principalities and past in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. The manifold wisdom of God. Amplified Bible, you know, calls it the many sided wisdom of God in all its infinite varieties. The manifold wisdom of God, the many-sided wisdom of God in all its infinite varieties. The church, God's people, they are an envy of the heavenly beings. That's the truth. They envy us. They envy us. The angels in heaven particularly the angels in the light, those that are on the side of God, they envy the church. To the intent that now unto principalities and powers in the heavenly places, they might be known by the church. They are looking at the church to understand God's wisdom through the church. When they see how God deals with the church, then they begin to understand certain dimensions of wisdom that they are incapable of knowing. That's what our scripture is saying. The angels, for instance, they, may, they don't understand the issue of redemption because they have not fallen. Except the demonic ones, the fallen angels, the ones that fall with the devil, those ones fell. Perhaps they knew what it means to fall. But the angels in the light, the principalities and powers, they are on the side of God. They have not fallen in the same way that Lucifer fell. They have not fallen in the same way that Adam fell into sin and lost the divine nature and lost the glory of God. They haven't fallen. So when, how would they understand redemption if they have not fallen into sin? How would they understand salvation? For somebody who has not really, you know, fallen into sin, how would they understand salvation? They don't understand. So when God is talking to about salvation in heaven, when he's talking about the Lamb of God being slain since the foundation of the world, they are hearing that conversation. It doesn't make sense to them. They can't really relate. But, but, but then when they begin to see God's dealing in the church and with the church and through the church, our God is saving us in the church. Our God is empowering us to go into the world and manifest his wisdom. Ah, then they also begin to gain understanding of what the wisdom of God is. The principalities, the heavenly beings, they begin to receive revelation and insight into the will of God. They understand that God's will for this time is to establish his kingdom. They understand, oh, in establishing his kingdom, this is what God wants to achieve. He's trying to reconcile man back to himself. So it is through the dealings in the church that they can fathom what, what the wisdom of God fully is. Now, there are two things I want us to look at, two examples here of workmanship that I want us to consider, just two examples. I mean, when we look all around us, there are many other examples of creative masterpieces. There are so many. You can look at a sculpture, for instance. A sculpture takes a, you know, a lump of marble. In that shape, it's formless, it's shapeless originally but he has a vision in his mind he has a picture a design he might decide i want to make an effigy or a portrait if you like of winston churchill one time you know former prime minister of britain for instance maybe that's the 
that's the statute you want to make out of that lump of marble. Maybe they have decided, maybe the government has decided, oh, let's erect that statute of Winston Churchill, for instance, in, you know, in front of uh, uh, the, uh, the parliament in Westminster, in front of the houses of parliament in Westminster. Maybe the decision of government that we want the, the FPG or the statute of Winston Churchill made in marble to be put there in front of houses of parliament. So they need a, a, a sculpture to be able to make that. But then he has to first imagine, he has to first picture. Maybe he will have to go to the archive and get pictures of Winston Churchill and all that to give him an idea of how the man looked like when he lived. So it, it comes first and foremost with imagination. And once that imagination is formed, the, the conception is in the mind of the kind of Winston Churchill that he wanted to make, then it takes that lump of marble and it begins to work at it. It begins to chisel, it gets a piece of chisel and it begins to chisel off, chisel off, chisel off and get a picture of Winston Churchill or an image or a statue of him out of that. And when that thing is put there in front of the uh, Houses of Parliament in Westminster, it becomes if something that everybody begins to admire, they look at it, it's beautiful. Also, we can look at furniture makers, the extent to which they go. When they go, you know, to places where they buy their things, uh, the items and raw materials, maybe the wood that they need, the nails that they need, the gums that they need, and they just go there and buy all of these woods and they take, bring it into the factory where it's not visible and they begin to work at those uh, items, at those raw materials. Before they can do that, they already have in their, in their mind an idea of the kind of furniture they intend to make. Maybe it's a sofa that they want to make. They already picture that in their mind and then they set to work. And out of the ordinary, out of the insignificant material that when you look at them, you will even despise them. Then out of that comes out, they're able to fashion out a sofa. They put you know, a leather around it and it becomes beautiful. When we go into the showroom and we see it, we don't see the work that's been done behind the scene to produce it. But we look at the finished product. The, the masterpiece, and it becomes something that is enviable, something you want to buy, you want to pay for because it's valuable. So on and on and on, we can look around us and pick masterpieces. Well, I want to restrict it to two things. The first one being the pot that is made or molded by a potter. A pot that is made or molded by a potter. And I want to read Isaiah chapter 64. Isaiah 64. Isaiah 64. Verses 6 to 8. But we all are, but we are all as an unclean thing. And all our righteousnesses are filled with rags, and we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. And there is none that calleth upon thy name, that stirreth up himself to take hold of thee, for thou hast hid thy face from us, and hast consumed us because of our iniquities but now O lord thou art our father we are the clay and thou art our potter and we are all the work of thine hand we are all the work of thine hand that is israel the relationship of israel and god their sins made them unclean all their self-righteousness were like filled the wrath and they were fading away because of iniquity. They were like winds that was being blown away. None was calling upon God. 
And uh, because of that, God also hid his, his face, his favor from them. But when they came back to God, now they acknowledge, say, but now, oh Lord, you are our father. We are the clay. You are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. So I want us to understand here where we all, it all began. We are the raw material. Shapeless, formless, insignificant before we became born again. Our destinies were marred by sin. Useless, made useless on the account of iniquity. Not fit for God's purpose. Not something that is desirable, worthwhile, worth using. But God in his mercy, just like every of these you know, people who makes the furniture, who makes the uh, sculpture, or you know, the potter that makes the clay. The starting point is not always something that is good or pleasant to the eye. When the potter goes there and he gets the clay, there's nothing good about the clay. When the furniture maker goes and you know get the pieces of wood and all the nails and all there's nothing really desirable about that. So the starting point always. We must be mindful of the starting point. That God from glory to glory is changing us. That somewhere is taking us to. But let's also not forget where God picked us from. Here it says, He is the potter and we are the clay. We are all the work of His hands. And I also want us to read Jeremiah. That gives us a graphic description of what the Potter is to the uh, clay. Jeremiah chapter 18 from verses 1 to 6. Then said they, Come. Oh, sorry. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 18, verse 1. The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause thee to hear my word. Then I went down to the potter's house, and behold, he wrought a walk on the wheels. So the potter was walking on the wheels. I know in our contemporary, unless we understand poetry, we might not really be able to understand about that wheel is the, the tool, the equipment that, the, that is used to fashion out a pot. In in the olden days, it used to be two circular stones, stones that are round, you know, one at the top, the other at the bottom. And, uh, you know, you know, the top one is on, on top of a table and the, the bottom one is beneath, underneath the table. And I think there are bar hands that are connected to both of them. And um, also, you know, the, the, there is a bit underneath that the 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 porter with his leg presses and so there is a movement there is a motion that is being passed from the stone underneath to the one at the top and so he places the, the clay at the top one and with his two hands he begins to mold them as the as the thing you know turns around as the tone, tones turns around he begins to mold them much later you know in history they said it, the, the, the stones were replaced by wood, but it's the same concept. So the wheels are actually made with wheels. You know, that, that, you know they are circular uh, stones you know, at the top at the bottom, just like a wheel, connected by, you know, uh, uh, by, by rod. And on top of it, the, the clay, the lumpy clay is, play, is, is placed on it. And with his hands, is, you know, the, the potter is actually making a pot. Verse 4, and the vessel that he made, the pot that he made of clay was made in the hand of the potter. So he made it again. Another vessel as seemed good to the potter to make it. We don't know exactly what happened here but the word mad simply meant that that vessel that port 
that he was trying to make out of clay, he became spoiled. He became damaged. It may have been that maybe it fell down from the wheel and it became damaged. And it may also have been that suddenly, as he was trying to form it, to shape it, there are some lumpy stones in the clay or some unwanted particles that suddenly just emerged. And he thought with these particles there, with stones there, or whatever it is, you know, it's, it's probably created, it's going to create a, mass, a hole in the, in the clay. And as such, he didn't like it. So the idea of being mad meant that what he was making was no longer fit for purpose. Something has gone wrong with it. It's spoiled. Perhaps it's damaged in the hand of the potter. But rather than saying, let me patch it up, or let me just try and amend it, and manage it, he didn't do that. He did not do that. Beloved, the Lord will not patch up our destiny. Say, well, God knows I have all these faults. God knows that I, I am frail. I am weak, you know, and perhaps he will just leave me the way I am. No, no. That's not the, the attitude of the potter to the clay. And certainly that was not the attitude in this particular vivid description, Jeremiah chapter 18. God doesn't just patch up or let me manage or just make do. No. He wants the best of us and he wants the best for us. And so what did the potter do? Brother, let's take note. He said he made it again another vessel. In other words, he said, look, I don't, this is not coming out the way I wanted it. But out of this same lump, not another one, out of this same one, you know, he made another vessel out of the same one. As seemed good to the potter to make it. So whatever was wrong with the old one, the potter, you know, got rid of it. And from that same lump of clay, he fashioned another one. Such that seemed good to make of it. And I believe this is what the Bible is saying when it says, we know, for we know that all things, they work together for good. For those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. So no matter how bad a, a, a life of a believer is, God is still working. It's like it. It's like it. You can't give up on a believer. And a believer should not give up on himself. Because God is not finished with that destiny yet. Until that vessel conforms to God's purpose. Until God makes that which seems good to himself out of that vessel. God does not give up on us. I think that's the truth here. I want us to uh, understand. And we must not give up on ourselves. Some of us, we look at the past, we have lives we have lived. And sometimes we carry some of those behavior, you know, and some of the addictions, people carry them even into Christianity. And they begin to see themselves struggling with certain aspects of their lives. And they try hard and try hard and try hard. God does not give up on us. Just like this potter is not giving up on the clay. And we cannot give up on ourselves as well. From glory to glory is changing us. Until we become conformed to his image, there is no giving in and there is no giving up. So he made of it again from the same, not another clay, from that same clay, he made another vessel, such as it seems good to him. Then the word of the Lord came to me saying, O house of Israel. So this is an analogy for Israel. God is trying to give a picture, paint a picture of Israel. O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this water? I know you are mad in my hands, Israel. You are stubborn, unyielding. You have so many faults. I can't use you the way you are, Israel. You are rebellious. You are stubborn. You are not really ready to do my will. You are not even really ready to know my will. That's what God was saying with that picture. 
O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter said the Lord? Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in my hand, O house of Israel. God was telling Israel, I don't want to dash you down to the pieces because the potter never did that. Even though you are not fit for purpose because of your rebellion, if only you will still yield to me. Even though you are mad in my hand, but if only you still let me. You see, that clay still let the potter did what the potter wanted to do with it. If only you will let me, I can make out of you, despite your rebellion, I can still fashion you and make a vessel of you so that is useful for me. Such that is good for me. I can make a beautiful, glorious, good vessel out of this vessel that is spoiled, that is deformed. That's the message God, through the mouth of Jeremiah, was passing on to Israel. He said, you are a clay in my hands. I'm the potter. And I have the power to do what seems right and good to me with the clay. If the clay will let me. And then in verse 7. At what instant I shall speak concerning a nation. And concerning a kingdom. To pluck up and to pull down and to destroy it. If that nation against whom I have pronounced. Turn from their evil. Can you see? If they turn. Like, like that clay. If they will let God turn from their evil. I will repent of the evil that I thought to do unto them. So it's an analogy of the relationship between God and Israel. Right. I want us to also look at. So the potter uses pressure to produce the required shape. That's the first thing I want us to see about the relation between this potter and the pot. When he's putting it on the wheel and the wheel is going around and is Walking with his hands on the clay, it's a picture of pressure. He's pressing it, he's turning it around, he's moving it up, he's moving it down, he's turning it around, he's putting pressure, he's applying pressure on it. And brethren, that's also part of what happens to us as believers. See? For God to get the desired shape from out of our lives, for us to conform to his, his nature, he allows, and sometimes he does initiate himself. There are times when God in, initiates the pressure himself. And there are times when the enemy is initiating the pressure and God is allowing it and is permitting it. Like as in the case of Job. But whether God initiates or he permits, let's note, brethren, that pressure is not designed to destroy the pot. We've never, we've never seen any a pot destroyed here. It's never designed to destroy the pot. It's never designed so that the pot can be broken into pieces and it's no longer usable. No. It is all designed to produce the required shape, the required vessel out of the lumpy clay. That's what the pressure is designed for. We see the same picture of this pressure painted for us in John chapter 15 verse 2, brethren. When he says, when Jesus himself taught us, using the analogy of the plant and the branch, every branch in me that abides on the vine, Jesus, he said, I prune it. Another version says, you know, that he, he purges it in order that he may bring forth more fruit. He purges it. He prunes it. When the branch abides, is abiding, it's not that it's sinning or anything, yet because he needs to bring his fruitfulness to a new level, because he needs to bring forth more fruit, there is a pruning that takes place. There is a purging that takes place. That's the pressure. That's the pressure. We can't escape it. We can't run away from it. It's, it's divinely you know, designed for our fruitfulness. It says, I prune it. The pruning means they will take, you know, uh, um, uh, you know, that thing that looks like scissors. And they will begin to cut off all the dead leaves. 
on the, on the branch, hanging to the branch, attaching itself to the branches. Everything that is not, not desirable, that is unwanted, that is, you know, around the branches, that can affect its, its, its fruitfulness, a smart farmer will begin to cut them off. If the branch could talk, the path, they will find it very painful. The pruning is not palatable for the branch, but it's designed for it to produce more fruit. And it's the same uh, with what this potter is in there. Applying pressure so that the pot can produce the required shape. Also, the potter alone determines the use and the, sh and the shape of each vessel. What the vessel is going to come out to be, the shape of it, whether it's going to be big, whether it's going to be small, whether it's going to be round, very round, or oblong round, whatever shape of it is determined, is the potter who has that power to determine that. The clay cannot talk. The clay can say, make me to be this shape. No, it's all the prerogative of the potter. It determines the shape as well as the use. Whether it's going to be used as a, as a, as a vessel to honor, or it's going to be a vessel unto this honor, is also the prerogative of the potter. Romans chapter 9. Romans chapter 9. Verses 20 to 24. Nay, but O man, who art thou that repliest against God? Shall the thing formed, he's talking about a pot here now, shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? Why have you made me this way? It's just like somebody challenging God now and say, Why have you made me? you know, short in stature, or why have you made me tall in stature? He doesn't have the power to do that because we don't, of our own, you know, decide our height. We don't have the power, the right to do that. Verse 21, as not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor of the same lump, and another unto the son. He has the power to do it. Of one lump, he can decide, okay, out of this one lump, I'm going to make this vessel, this pot, unto Hannah. And after the same lump, he can decide to make another one unto the son. What if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction? And that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had afore prepared unto glory. Even us whom he had called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. So here we see two pictures also. Even though they are both from the same lump, the picture, the vessel or the pot of the Jews and the pot of the Gentiles. And out of that one singular lump, God has fashioned out two kinds of vessel. The Gentiles being the vessel to honor. Vessel that he himself, in his sovereignty that we can't question and challenge, fitted for his mercy. He fitted them for his mercy and the, and, and the riches of his glory. And then, out of the same law, because both Gentiles and Jews, we are all coming from the same Abraham. We are all coming from the same Christ. We are all coming from the same God. Out of that same lump, Christ, or Abraham, if you like, is made a, another vessel, the Jewish vessel. And those ones, temporarily, not forever, God has fitted them for us. They are object of his anger. At the moment, because of the things that they did and because of their rebellion, which culminated, of course, in the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. So all of this thing is still the outworking of his purpose. We know that at the end, Israel is going to be saved. So we can say that for at the moment, they are undergoing that pressure. The pressure we talked about, the pressure that the potter uses 
to fashion the port. Israel is undergoing that pressure at the moment. And it's not palatable. It's not, it's not something that, that is enjoyable for them. That's why everywhere they get to, they are being persecuted. Everywhere they get to, people want to kill them. It's part of the pressure. But ultimately, it's so that they can form the shape that God wanted for them. So that they can run back to God. And as a nation, nationally, they are going to be saved. So that's what Paul is trying to pass across to us here. So that God alone determines the use and the shape of each vessel. My prayer, brethren, is that we would become in his hands vessels of honor and not the vessels of dishonor. You see, the vessel of honor and vessel, it doesn't mean that the vessel of dishonor is evil or is, is, is bad. You know, it's just saying that one is for a, a, a more honorable use. And the other one is for a less honorable use. Take, for instance, if you have a plate, let's even say it's a bowl that you use in the house. You know, maybe a bowl of fruit, for instance. When you put fruit on and you put on your dining table. And when you want to eat fruit and you are there by the or after you have had your normal dinner or meal, and you reach out into the bowl and you take nice fruit. You know, you treat that bowl honorably. Why? Because... It is from there you eat. It's a good bowl. It's a good plate because, you know, you are using it to eat, to feed yourself. So you treat it honorably. It's a vessel unto honor because the use is much more honorable. But then if it's a bowl that you use in the garden, like, as, like, like a watering bowl for watering the plants, and after you have finished watering the plants with it, you just drop it there in the garden. You don't even bother to clean it or wash it if it's dirty and bring it in until there's another use, use for it. Maybe another, another day. You just drop it there or you put it in the, in the shed somewhere in the back garden. It's also a vessel and it's a vessel for use. But the use, the purpose is not as honorable as the one in the house. So you don't treat it with much honor or much respect. That is what it means to be a vessel unto dishonor. It doesn't mean that it's a bad vessel, but you are using it for a less honorable task. And there are people in the body of Christ that are Christians like that. That is how they are. That's the vessel that they are in the hands of God. They are vessels for a less honorable use. It doesn't mean they are useless or they are not fit for the master's use. But it's just that the use that God will put them into is not as honorable as some other vessels. Now, the other picture is that written. Written. We can also see that uh, a, you know, a masterpiece as something literary, something that has to do with uh, writing. And from the definition, we can clearly see that that poem is a work of heart. And in a sense, all of us believers, we are, we are like poems. Poems. You know, collectively, God has written us, our lives is wired us together like poem. Each of us being carefully selected, placed in the right position. When you look at poetry or poems, the words are carefully selected. If at the end you want the words to rhyme, you have to put the right word in the right position at the end. If you want them to rhyme, rhyming words, they are carefully selected, carefully positioned. And so also in the body of Christ, God has placed us there, just like in poetry, like poems. He has carefully selected us and he has positioned us in the right position in relation to all other believers around us so that we can fulfill his desire, fulfill his plan, fulfill his counsel. That is drawing on the meaning of the word workmanship. Also, as, as believers, God has placed us on the earth as the epistle that the world should read that the epistles that the world should read and understand about God, it's our lives. Um, uh, if I may ask, please, uh, there is a, a bit of uh, background noise I'm hearing, which is feeding through into the recording, please. If you can mute our, our laptop or our phone, that would be appreciated, please. Uh, in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, Verses 1 to 3, 7 Corinthians 3, 1 to 3. Do we begin again to commend ourselves, or need we, as all mothers, epistles of commendation to you, or letters of commendation from you? You are epistle, written in our hearts, 
known and read of all men, forasmuch as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshly tables of the earth. So the word read the lives of those whom we minister. So this particularly to us who are ministers is a challenge, is a task. As you are ministering the word, ministering, the lives of the people who, to whom we minister are transformed. They are changed. That's what Paul is saying there. The Spirit of God begins to change their lives. So the Holy Spirit begins to minister the word into their lives, to change them, begin to change the, the, the hearts. And when, you know, uh, the, the people, the believers under us, under our discipleship, when they now begin to live the life, they become the epistles that men begin to read. In other words, they don't need even to read the Bible to understand what Christianity is about, to understand the will of God, to understand how God expects us to live. The moment they begin to see us, the lives of the believers, then they begin to see the epistles. That's what he's saying. They say, ye our uh, epistle. Paul is addressing the believers now in, F, in, uh, in Corinth. He says, you are our epistle. As we minister the word to you, the Holy Spirit, you know, uses as acting as the pen, is writing the word into your heart. And you become our epistles. And when you also begin to live out the word, the word then can read, can read the epistles. Just like we also, we can also read the epistles. You are epistles written in our hearts, known and read of all men. So God wants us, brethren, our lives to be the epistles that the world around us will read. And in doing that too, we become his creative masterpiece. In the sense of we become the words, the epistles, the written epistles. You know, in, in human form, in the flesh, that the world can read. What are the essential features of workmanship and what's God's requirement? What kind of works are we created for? What's our responsibility? Brethren, just like we did say when we looked at uh, the, the, uh, the church being the body of Christ, the essential feature of this workmanship the reason why God has made us is creative workman, workmanship, is creative workmanship. The very reason, the primary reason, and the reason why God has also made us or created us for good works is in order for us to fulfill his will for, for our lives and to obey God. That is a, it's, it's all at, at the same thing. Just like the body, is also it says, say, a body thou has prepared me. And I've come to do thy will, O oh God. The body is for the will. We saw that in the picture of the body of Christ. It's to do the will. Also, the workmanship is to do his will. It's to do God's will and to obey him. But then how do we do that primarily? And we also mentioned this uh, briefly, I think, uh, uh, two weeks ago, when we looked at Romans chapter 12, verses 1 to 2. two. So finally, brethren, I beseech you by the mercy of God that we should present our bodies, living sacrifice, holy and acceptable, you know, which is our reasonable service. Say, be not conformed to the world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may know what is that good, perfect, what is that acceptable, perfect uh, will of God. Let me paraphrase it. You know, so what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God? So that's the, so knowing God's will and obeying it is the, all uh, uh, the primary uh, requirement of being God's creative ma masterpiece. But then how do we know God's will? And how do we get to the level where we can obey it? Those are the few things I want to summarize. Number one, we must in our work with God confess and forsake sin as soon as we are conscious of it. Let it not prolong in our lives because it tends to slow us down. Sin is a weight, brethren. We need to know that sin is a weight. Whether that is lie, whether that is whatever sin it is, you know, it's a weight. And that's why the Bible says that uh, we should 
we should uh, lay aside every weight that does easily beset us and we're in a race you know if we don't lay the sin aside by confession and forsaking them they weigh us down they slow us down we can't enjoy the best of god you know our fellowship with god is is is, is affected and that is why one sin is you know is brought to our consciousness by the holy spirit it might not even be at the moment that we have done it maybe at the other time when we are praying that the Holy Spirit, or when we're meditating, the Holy Spirit says, oh, you still have this aspect, this that you said, this that you did, that you haven't confessed this. When it comes into our consciousness, let's always make effort to confess and forsake it. So I'm, uh, Proverbs 28, verse 13 says, if you will cover his sin, shall not prosper. He can't do well, you know, in, in his Christian world. But he who confesses and forsakes them shall have mercy. When we confess and forsake them, there is mercy. Promised. Also, we need to continually and unconditionally be yielded to God. Just like that potter, uh, just like the clay in the hand of the potter, all he can do is to yield. He doesn't have the power over, over it, it, itself. The clay does not have power to do anything of itself. But in the hand of the potter, he can submit. He can surrender. He can yield. And say, look, make of me whatever seems good to you. And that is the same thing God draws from us. When we come, you know, to the to the to the place when we realize that God has the power to make of us what seems good to Him, but that we are willing and ready to cooperate with Him by yielding. So the Christian race, brethren, the Christian work is not that of effort. Effort. What can I do for myself? What this particular habit that I have, I cannot get rid of it by myself. You will never be able to do it. The more you try to get rid of that habit, ungodly habit, the more difficult it becomes. Why? Because God has not designed, you don't have the power. It's just like the clay saying, look, I don't want to this shape. I want to have that other shape. What can I do to take on the shape that I want? No, the clay doesn't have the power. All that the clay can do is to be flexible, not, not rigid, in the hand of the potter. That's all. And that's all that God is asking us to, to let go and, say, and let go, to yield and submit and surrender and say, Lord, have your way. Do with me what seems good to you. The scripture uh, uh, wants us to live with us for that is, uh, is Philippians chapter 2, verse 13. Say, for it is God that works in us, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Even the willingness to change, the willingness you know, to, to, to grow, the willingness to, to deepen our work with God. It's God that gives us the willingness. It's God that gives us the desire to change, to make amends. It's God. It's God that gives us the desire. How much more to now do it? So it is God that, it is God that works in us, both to will or to desire, and then to do that which is desired. So then what's our, our part then? If it's God that is doing it, our part is to cooperate. Our part is to yield. Our part is to say just like the clay, Lord, I know you are working, you are working my life. Do it, Lord. I won't resist. I won't be stubborn. I won't refuse. Have your way. Just do it. And then we see the Holy Spirit working it out. What it works in us, it begins to work out to us. We need to study the word of God to discern his will and then to do whatever it tells us to do. That's very key, brethren. There is nothing that is potent to change us, to conform us to God's will so that we can bring out the shape that God wants us to have so that we can, you know, conform to the use that God desire, desires of us like the word of God. Nothing is more potent, nothing is more efficacious to do that than the word. Prayer won't do it, brethren. Fasting will not achieve it. If we desire change in our work with God to be better Christians, it can only come by one way. It is by the word of God. John 7, 17. If any man will do his will, he shall know of his doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. For us to do his will, we need to know the doctrine, the doctrine being the word of God. Because God's word is the revelation of God's will his word his will is revealed in his word and until we study it for ourselves and know it personally 
we may not be able to do God's will as we should. Of course, prayer is also key in helping us to know His will, find His will, and to do it. We need to pray. Spend time in prayer every day. And it doesn't have to be for too long. It may just be bits, bits, in the, you know, here and there. Bits of prayer here and there. Praying, you know, before the Lord. It doesn't have to be loud. There are prayers we say in our hearts. And God knows and understands our heart. And there are prayers that, you know, when they, we are walking on the road, we are praying. Even when we don't, can't find the right words to, to, to utter in understanding in English, we can turn to the language of the Spirit and begin to pray in the, in the Holy Ghost. God hears and God understands. What these godly habits do is that they deepen our work with God. I've come to find out these godly habits. And it takes you doing something, a particular thing, consistently for 30 days, and it becomes a habit. So don't say, well, how do I make a habit of praying? No, just first and foremost say, Lord, help me to pray daily. If you do that praying daily for 30 days consecutively without breaking, it becomes a habit. You won't need to be reminded before you do it anymore. It becomes a habit. So for us to deepen, you know, godly habits, which helps deepen our work, we just need them to, we just need to do do that thing consistently. Even if it's meditation, try it and meditate consistently daily. It might be 30 minutes, just on one verse, on, on the train or wherever. Do it consistently for 30 days, it becomes a habit, such that you don't forget that you need to do it because it becomes part and part of it. There's an example that I always use of godly habits, and that's of the psalmist, I believe David, Psalms 55. Psalm 55. Verse 17, Golly Abia, evening and morning and at noon will I pray and cry aloud and you shall hear my voice at every point of the Jewish sacrifice in the morning, in the noon and the evening. Initially, it used to be two sacrifices in the day, the morning and in the evening, but later I became free. At, that, at those times when they go into the temple to offer sacrifices, this is the time David is also praying. Evening and morning and at noon will I pray and cry aloud and he shall hear my voice until it becomes a habit. These are godly habits that deepen our work with God. Psalms 119. Psalms 119. Verse 164. Another godly habit that can help improve our work with the Lord is in verse 164. Seven times a day do I praise, do I praise thee because of thy righteous judgment. Seven times a day. There is no law anywhere written in the law that David had to pray or what, whoever is the writer of this psalm had to pray seven times. But because he wanted to deepen his work with God, he made a habit of it. So he started maybe once, said, okay, let me even pray seven days. And he did it second time, he did it third time. By the time he did it consistently for a number of days, it became a habit. It became a habit. A habit. That's how to deepen our work with God by forming godly habits. And then also we need brethren to respond to opportunities for service as God leads. We are a creative masterpiece, not to be an ornament on the shelf and be gathering dust. It's like you go into an antique shop and you buy a very beautiful portrait. And rather than hanging it on the wall, you just put it on the table, in the wrap, in the in the in the, in the wrap that it comes uh, uh, in. Now, that's just a, you know an ornament that's not put into use. It's not fit for purpose. God wants us to be out there, to be useful. That's the whole purpose. Where we are is master, is creative masterpiece. When he puts us in the showroom, it's so that men can buy us and derive value from us. When a furniture maker makes a nice uh, sofa, they put them in showrooms so that people can buy them and put them into use. The same thing with this, you know, uh, sculpture, it's so that it can be put into use. The same thing with books that are written, put into use. The same thing with the potter. He makes the pot so that the pot can be put into use. So the, ultimately, God wants us to be fit and useful uh, uh, for, 
for him for himself. Second Timothy chapter two verse twenty. Second Timothy two twenty. So brethren, let me encourage us to find opportunities to serve. That may be in personal and personal level. You don't have to belong. Of course, it's desirable to belong to a local assembly where we're encouraged to work in ushering department, children's department, choir, you know, or any form of uh, activity group within a local church. That's fantastic if that opportunity exists. But even if it does not exist, it's not sufficient for us to wear because in the church there are, there are no groups where I can perform, or maybe my particular giftings and skills. They don't have such opportunities created for them. For instance, you might be good in teaching. And there is no Sunday school to teach in the church. And there are no Bible study groups that you can teach. We must begin to cry out unto God, to open our eyes and, and, and give us opportunities. Who says you cannot start a house fellowship in your house if you pray? God can use you there if that's your gift. What about preaching? Sharing the goodness? That's an opportunity to serve. We must trust the Holy Spirit to lead us. There is always an opportunity. What about the workplace? It's an opportunity to tell somebody about the love, love of Jesus. We must not be an ornament for decoration. We must be a vessel fit for the master's use. Verse 20, 2 Timothy 2. But in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. And finally, brethren, we must learn to cultivate the fellowship and counsel of other Christians. Fellowship is key. It's part of what God has designed for us to know his will and for us to manifest that will. Hebrews 10, 25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. The early church met house to house. Sometimes they met in the caves. Sometimes they met, you know, in so, so many hidden places because of persecution. Underground church, but yeah, they were meeting. And now in our contemporary culture where there is no such persecution, there is nothing forbidding public worship. We don't have an excuse to say, well, I'm a Christian. As long as I'm reading the Bible in the house, I don't need to go to church. There are some believers that have that funny idea. I don't know where they got it from. The churches that are underground that can say, ah, if we meet now, maybe like the Chinese underground church, for instance, they should have every cause to be afraid because they, if they meet openly, maybe in a child, in a church, or in a, in, a, in a brother's house, they can be killed, you know, arrested and put into jail, maybe in North Korea and some other place like that. But yeah, they still found places to meet. They met, meet in places. Sometimes they travel far wide in some, you know, uh, bushes some wild bushes, and they meet there secretly to pray God and share the word and all that encouragement. Like they go going to hide rocks. They go there and meet. Because they understand that there is power in, in uh, uh, Christians coming together to pray. They know that that's the man. How do you want to partake, participate in communion? You can't stay in your house and say you want to take communion. Communion with, to yourself. We take it together, the body. That's one of the reasons why we need to meet. How do you want to be able to minister to each other and one another's needs on a personal level? It is by meeting. So brethren, we must cultivate that fellowship and counsel of other Christians. It is part of what it takes for us to do the will of God. Lord, we thank you. We adore you. We give you glory. We appreciate you, Father, for the things you have enabled us to see in your word tonight. We come, O oh God, acknowledging that you are the potter and we are the clay. Father, we pray and ask earnestly, do with us what seems good to you. From today, Lord, we yield to you. The grace to surrender, to yield, to submit. Knowing fully well you can't mismanage our life. Knowing fully well you cannot misuse us as the potter. Your, your, the, the, your ultimate for us is the best. Your interest for us is the most beautiful, is the most glorious. And Father, to trust you to that extent that you mean the best for us. And as such, we can commit our lives and yield and submit our lives unto you so that you can fashion us the way you want to. This we pray and receive the grace, Lord, to make this commitment. 
individually and collectively as a people. In Jesus' precious name, amen.